pieces. Welcome to our nine o'clock online service. It's, it's good to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to be with you this morning. Thanks for joining us. A few quick announcements as we get into our morning. First off, I want to let you know right away, uh, for those of you that might be wondering, we had to cancel our outdoor service at 1050 this morning because of kind of surprise weather forecast. Rain's coming a little bit earlier, it looks like. So we're just doing the nine o'clock online service this morning. And uh, just that reminder to continue to pay attention to our website for updates. And uh, also, if you want to um, connect with us in any way to uh, contact us about something, to put in a prayer request, to give online, mosaicmansfield.com. And uh, keep an eye on the, on the Facebook page and stuff, too. Um, so, no outdoor service today. But moving forward, just want to continue to make sure that everybody kind of knows the scoop as best we can right now. If we go back to orange or yellow on Thursday. Hopefully we do. Then we'll go back to our plan to do two services here at the church inside. Um, remember, there will not be RSVP for that, except if you would like to pre-check in your kids because children's ministry will be limited in those classes. So you can just come, but it'll be first come, first serve with the uh, children. So if you would like to, um, you know, earlier the better as far as pre-checking in your kids to make sure that they've got a spot. So um, yellow or orange, we're two services inside. If we go, if we stay on red, then the plan will continue to be nine o'clock online. But if the weather permits, we'll try to do the outside service in the, um, in the green space here behind the church. Um, on Thursdays, we're going to be watching the updates and then we're going to be getting the word out to you via probably a Facebook live. Um, if we're in red, we'll, we'll make sure we're letting you know what the plan is. So, um, and then also texting, um, you know, if you want to make sure you're on that text list, email, all those things. So we'll be posting um, all those updates on Thursdays. Make sure you pay, pay attention to those. Um, let's see, a couple more things. There are several uh, groups for men and women that just started here this past week, but they're going on for the next five weeks or so, and you can still get in on those. So check out the website because there's a couple for men, a couple for women. Um, in different ways, a Zoom one, a couple of them in homes, one for the guys here at the church. So check those out. Um, register uh, through the website. You'll be able to find the link there for that. Holler at us if you have any questions. And, uh, and then lastly, the drive through adventure is almost here. So next Saturday, we'll be doing the big scavenger hunt around town, competing against each other, winning prizes. It's going to be a lot of fun. So um, jump online and register for that this week. You can actually just show up next week. It's helpful for us if you register in advance. So make those plans, do it with some friends, whatever you want to do there. <coughs> and that is Saturday, you'll uh, check in between one and four and you'll have two hours to do the scavenger hunt thing. So the drive through adventure coming up really soon. I think that's it for our announcements this morning. So let me say a prayer for us and we'll get back to worship. 
Father, you are, you are good this morning. You're always good. We're thankful for that. Thank you for your love and your grace in our lives. Thank you that we know that you are walking with us. And thank you for this opportunity to come together and, and worship you and hear from you this morning. So as always, we ask you to lead and guide us. We ask you to bless this worship team and Tony as he prepares to speak. And would you help us to open up our ears and our hearts to you this morning as we move into another week, Lord. We want to be connected to you and walking with you and on mission with you. So we look to you, Father, this morning, and we're thankful today. In Jesus' name, amen.
became sin Who knew no sin We might become His righteousness He humbled Himself
cast my mind to Calvary when Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree join the voices of the angels. May we, Father, give you our very best this morning as you have given us your very best. 
And may we see you for who you are and then receive from you your declaration of who we are in you, that we are beloved. We are children of the Most High. We are co-heirs with your son, Jesus. And we await the moment you come back for us. And we, and we reside with you forever. We pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, good morning, all. Hope you're well. Um, certainly appreciate. <laughs> I'm waiting. I was babysitting. Um, it's all right. That's all right. The pianist needed to uh, take my grandson. It's good to see everybody virtually this morning. We've got a lot to get through today, and actually I'm quite excited about what it is we're doing. It's going to be a very practical, I think, morning, and this is what I need you to do if you would. I need you, if you don't have the notes, if you haven't looked them up, man, I would encourage you to do that uh, because we're, there's a lot in it, and um, we're frankly going to be... Um, we're going to be just working our way through them. I'm not going to dilly-dally a whole lot today. Not that I normally do, I suppose. But uh, what I want to do is I want, to, I want to continue to move forward in what it is I believe God has for us in His Word and in these times. So we're going to be in 1 Peter 4. And, but we're not going to stay there very long. We're using this as an anchor text. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go through how we should live. How do we live as followers of Christ? What, what, what does it look like? Um, and then how do we respond to certain things? And I'm, I'm really hoping to get through everything we have today. So one of, if, what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin to read from the notes. Um, uh, as followers of Jesus, we have great joy in the, in the hope we have in Christ. That's really what we just sang. You know, and as we were singing that song, I was actually reading Revelation 5, and John says, and I saw the Lamb, and I saw the throne, and I saw the, the, the angels and the elders, and everything that, the, the vast numbers of all those who were praising. And, it's, and it caused me to reflect on the song we were singing, my heart, you know, my heart rising up, certainly, but that our voices, even though we feel in these times, we feel like we're isolated, we feel like we're alone, we feel like um, we just... We wonder where God is. Our voices blend with the angels and with the elders, and we offer Jesus praise. And so, as followers of Jesus, we have this great joy in the hope we have in him, in the very real forgiveness of our sins, all right, the idea that we were sinful and we are no longer sinful, but in fact, we are justified, that God declared us innocent in his sight, accepted, approved, made right with him. It is here that our peace is anchored, that God, our maker, becomes our father, and we, in God the Son, Jesus, becomes, we become cherished, beloved children, not only holy and pleasing, but granted favor. He has, he has declared us righteous. He has, he, he has made us holy in Christ Jesus. But on top of that, he's granted us favor. And that favor is that we, we are, by, with, by Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we are escorted into his presence. We are welcome into the throne room. We're welcome into the presence of God and we're escorted gladly by our brother and savior, Jesus. And this is all true and it is what we rejoice in. It is the hope of God's glory, the expression of his goodness and it is held out to all who would receive it, given to those who would accept it, that in doing so they would become children of God. With that, we must also come to grips with our suffering and that in this world, it, we, we, won't, we will not fully realize the incredible gift we have in Christ Jesus. We, we live in it. We are, our hope is anchored in it. We will experience it from moment to moment, but in the meantime, there will be suffering. And, but that suffering we must view from the lens of, of what it is that God is doing. And so if suffering viewed from the lens and the expectation of everything should be better, there seems to be something contra contradictory to the gospel. So that we have this life in Christ, we have this joy, that we have this incredible hope. The fact that we still suffer seems contradictory to what it is that God has done and what it is we should have been able to expect. We have been forgiven, we are accepted. For crying out loud, shouldn't the suffering end? Now, Jesus doesn't seem to say so. Jesus said, no, in fact, it will not end. And so what I want to do, with all of that in mind, I want to read this passage from 1 Peter 4, and this is going to be an anchor spot. And to be honest with you, I'm not going to read a lot of scripture from this point forward, because what I want to do is I want to draw living principles um, out of this text, 
But also, if you have the notes, and again, if, even if you can't get to them now, get them later. I've put in dozens, literally dozens of, of, of verses for you to be able to go back to and to reflect on, to read, and to be encouraged by. So we're in 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 12. I'm going to pray before we read. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your encouragement. We thank you for the truth of who we are in you. Lord, may we never tire of hearing such a thing. May we never, may that not just bounce off our heads and hearts because we, we have heard it so often. May we recognize each morning your mercies are new, our experience with you is new, you are revealing yourself in a new and fresh way every day and your word is just like you. It is the expression of who you are. It is the expression of Christ Jesus himself. So may we enter into your word in such a way as to be encouraged, to be strengthened, to be instructed, to be corrected, um, to be aligned. May we enter it that way today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in 1 Peter 4. It says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you. So Peter is reminding us, don't be surprised at what you're, what you're struggling through right now. As though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. And last week we looked at that word participate. We participated with him in prayer. And now we participate with him in his suffering. So we go on. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. And his glory will be revealed in a number of different ways. It will be revealed to our hearts and minds as, he, as his spirit brings up the truth of who he is, the truth of who we are in him. That will all cause us to, to um, in participation, participating with his suffering, we'll be overjoyed when that, when that thought, that, that knowledge, that truth comes the, to the fore. But also as he is revealed in our lives, that we begin to reflect him more and more. This we ought to rejoice in, that God would do such a thing. Verse 14, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. In other words, if for whatever reason, just if somebody just finds out you're a Christian and, therefore, and they mock you for such a thing, or because of, the, because of your good and righteous conduct, for whatever reason they, they are opposed to you and you're insulted for it, we are, this is a blessing. This ought to, we ought to rejoice in such a thing. So he says, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory of God rests on you. You are different than the world. You are not the same as the world. You function differently from the world. And so we need to recognize that that is not always going to be received well in our world, by our world. And there could be insults that come, persecution that comes, opposition that comes, mocking. There are a number of things that could come through that. But we are to consider ourselves blessed because this is, listen, this is the assurance of that we, not only that we are in Christ, but his righteousness is being revealed in us. This, is, this should assure us of the truth of who we are in Christ. Now we're going to go to that in a minute, minute in terms of what this looks like practically. So bear with me. Verse 15. If you suffer... It should not be as a murderer or a thief. So look what it says in verse 14. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. But let it be for that reason. Let it be because the nature and the character of Jesus has been raised up in you. May it be because the goodness that is in you and that you are, that you are enacting are the expression of Jesus. Look what it says now. It says, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ and your life matches the name, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Remember, earlier Peter was saying this. He said, listen, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good, but even if you should suffer for what is right, for what is good? So he's reflecting on that thought. Verse 15 goes on to say this. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief, somebody who's breaking the law, somebody who's acting in an unbecoming fashion, somebody who's just sinful, Look what it says. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief. And we're, I want to stand and look at what it says next. Or, 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 or any kind of a criminal. And I, the, the, the word criminal has to do with just not being law-abiding, not being honest and true to the decorum and the law of the land. And so the idea here is this, that our lives should be, in essence, 
impeccable in regard to our civic duty, in regard to how we function as citizens, in regard to how we function as employers and employees. It is how we treat people, how we see people, it's how we act toward people. It is living a peaceable and law-abiding life. That's what Peter's saying. So he's saying this. He's saying, listen to me. No one should ever be able to watch your life. And, and in, in the midst of you calling yourself a Christian, your life is utterly contrary to that which is of Christ. So he's trying to make a, an important distinction here. He's saying, if you suffer, it should be because Jesus is being formed in you, shaped in you, and coming out from you. Don't let it be as one who is not respectful of the law, who is not abiding by the law, who is not living uh, uh, peaceably in the law, being a good citizen, a good neighbor. Don't let that be so. And then he adds something that's really important because all of that had to do with how we see the law of the land, how we live according to that law, how we live as a citizen, and, and, and how we conduct ourselves in terms of honesty, in terms of a job well done, in terms of not coveting other people's stuff, not, no, no thievery. We're very careful to be sure that we're living according to the decorum, to the law, to the civility and the peaceably, peaceability of the, lay, of, the, of the surrounding area. So he says, listen, don't let it be as a criminal. But then he adds this little caveat. He said, not even as a meddler. Don't let it be even as a meddler. Now, what's a meddler? A meddler is somebody that gets into somebody else's business. I want us to think about that for a minute. A meddler is somebody that gets into somebody else's business. So up to this point, he's talking about cr criminal activity, living civilly according to the law, peaceably under the law, and being a good citizen according to the law. That a Christian should, a Christian, that's, that is the, that's the least we can be in, the, in, 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 in the, this world. That is the least of our testimony. But look what he goes on to say. Don't let it even be that of a meddler. Well, what's a meddler? A meddler is somebody who gets involved in somebody else's business. Now, that can happen through a lot of different ways. One is just to stick your nose into something that doesn't belong. Another is to either gossip or slander about somebody. The minute you begin to talk about somebody in a way that is unbecoming to them, you have stuck your nose in their business, in their life, and, you're, and you, are, you are affecting their reputation and name. You're doing that. So it, it would cover even the manner in which we speak about someone. But in particular, a meddler is somebody who goes into somebody's life and tries to, and tries to coerce them into doing what they want them to do. So what's interesting about this is, is in the Greek, the, the, the idea of being a meddler, a Christian who is a meddler, is somebody who's trying to impose upon somebody else their belief system. Oh, you go, well, wait a minute. Aren't we supposed to share our faith? Well, absolutely we're to share our faith. But not through coercion, not through manipulation, not through guilt-mongering or shaming. None of that. Not even about arguing. Listen, the world is going to go about their life. Let them go about it the way they're going to go about it. You walk beside them, bring the kingdom into their life, live in such a way that they, you, they would ask you, why are you behaving the way you are? Why are you joyful in the midst of persecution? Why is it when I treat you poorly, you don't respond by, re by reciprocating that poor? Why is it you're living according to the law? So what if you take a little bit from work and you take it home? So what if you do a little bit of this and that? Why, why don't you? What? Here's the deal. It is not for a Christian to impose the kingdom of heaven on anyone or to impose the gospel on anyone or to impose the gospel ethic onto anyone. It's, that's not our role. What is our role? Our role is to live righteously in the context of this world. Our role is to bring the kingdom of heaven into the, every sphere in which we walk. Our role is to be like Jesus amongst the people so that when they see us, they go, what? 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 And they're compelled to ask. They, we become attractive. We, we are, we are actually fragrant. So when he's talking about meddling, he's talking about be really careful even how you share your faith, even how you view somebody who doesn't yet know Jesus. Be careful about imposing your beliefs or imposing your ethic or imposing your morals on the person with whom you're walking. That doesn't mean we don't call somebody to righteousness. It doesn't mean that we don't walk next to them and we have discussions regarding what is true and what is right and what is just. Remember, we're to be law-abiding too. We are to care for the widow and the orphan. We are to care about the lives of others. We ought to do that. And when we see somebody being oppressed, we need to lay our back over the top of that person. But what we're talking about is the idea that I would impose upon someone who's not in, who I have not earned the right to be heard, for, heard by, who I have not lived my life in such, with them in a way that would earn some credibility or the right to be heard or... 
even have the conversation, be really careful how you impose upon others, how you get involved in their life. Again, it doesn't mean that there isn't wise counsel to be had. It doesn't mean you can't answer questions when they're asked. We ought to, and we need to be prepared to do that. Meddling is a completely different thing. Meddling is when we put ourselves somewhere where we don't belong or we haven't earned the right to be there yet. It's a really important word. And so it's not merely, and then what are we doing for the reputation? How do we speak of those people? So look what it says again. We are to rejoice in as much as we participate in the sufferings of Christ so that we may be overjoyed when, he is, when his glory is revealed. When he, and again, that's temporal in the sense that his glory is revealed in and through us as his character rises up, but also as he returns as in his coming, that when he is seen, that we will be overjoyed because we, have been, we, we, are, we are utterly right with him, not only in terms of righteousness and being righteous, right with God because of Christ, but we are also in close proximity to him in terms of our assurance and in terms of our confidence because we've been walking closely with him. Verse 14, so he says, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for God's glory rests on you, but if you suffer, it should not be as somebody who is not being civil, who is not living according to the law, who's not being a good citizen, or even being a good neighbor, the meddler, right? However, look at verse 16, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. If you suffer on behalf of Jesus, do not be ashamed. If you suffer because your life reflects Christ, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name, that you carry the name of Christ. So what Peter is saying is let your life reflect Jesus in everything you do. That's not just the name of Christ or the law of Christ necessarily, but the very manner and way of Christ. However, if you should suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time, listen, verse 17, for it is time for judgment to begin, listen, with God's household. He's going to hold us accountable for our actions, for our behavior, for our attitude, for our speech. He's going to hold us accountable. And judgment begins with us. He's going to hold us accountable. That doesn't mean judgment for salvation. That is through, that is finished in Christ Jesus. He, if this is in regard to, to, how, to, to the proximity with which we walk here with him in regard to discipline when we have sinned and, and correction. And it also has to do with rewards in the end. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God, who refuse to believe in Christ Jesus, who, who will not put their faith in him? And this should not be an either or this or them, or us versus them. This should call us to, first of all, live a life that reflects Christ as we carry his name and, and, and that pleases him and brings, brings honor to him. But also we should grieve for those who, for whatever reason, is, is holding back the love of God and refuses to receive it. So Peter goes on to say, if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? If Jesus went through this for the sake of, the, of, of, of those who would, who would receive life, and that life now is an arduous life that includes suffering, how, how much more difficult it will be for the ungodly and the sinner who are refusing that grace and refusing the power of God? It's verse 19, so then, those who suffer according to God's will should entrust themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. In other words, as suffering comes, we ought not shrink back, we should not be ashamed, but in fact, we should entrust ourselves to God knowing that, in full confidence that he, is, he will be glorified in it, he will, he will guide us in and through it, and he is leading us into eternity. He, we are his. And so we are not to entrust ourselves to anything in this world, but we are to entrust ourselves to our Father. So, what I'm going to do from this point forward is I'm going to be picking these principles out, although I won't be referring back to them. I want us to see the practical application of what it is that Peter is calling us to. So the first thing I want to look at is this and ask the question, why should we be surprised? Why are we surprised? We are no longer of this world, according to John 17. Jesus prayed that for the disciples. Our holiness, our righteousness, and our goodness do not match this world. It's out of sync with this world. We are truly aliens and strangers. That's how Peter began this letter. And our perspective has been changed as our hearts have been changed. So as Christ Jesus has taken our hearts and molded them, shaped them, and, and infused his goodness and his righteousness, his character, how we view this world has changed because our hearts have changed. So why should we be surprised? This is like oil and water. And then we're to rejoice in, the, in participating, participating in the suffering of Christ. 
In, if you were to go back to Philippians chapter 1 and, verse, and chapter 3, what you would see is Paul saying, I am overjoyed at participating in the, in the suffering of Christ, and I'm praying that I would, I would understand and experience it in its fullness. What is that all about? This is a profound perspective that can and will change the way we view life. That as we, as we suffer on behalf of Jesus, or if for whatever reason comes, something comes upon us, especially in the name of Christ, we ought to rejoice because we are participating in his suffering. We are joining him in why he suffered among us. This is a profound perspective that can and will change the way we view life. It'll change the way we see our world because we'll begin to recognize suffering for what it is and what God intends to do with it. And so we will view our life, our times, our circumstances, and our people, our pe people around us and opportunities differently. We, we, are, we have the privilege of joining Jesus to suffer as he suffered. This is an imitation of Jesus as he came, and, uh, he came to suffer, now at, at, to suffer as we suffered. That's in Hebrews chapter 2 and, and 4. So as he joined us, we now get to join him. As he joined us in, his, in our suffering, we now get to join him in his suffering. And we suffer for a different reason now. And this is different. It's a different kind of suffering for different reasons. And there are two points I want to make regarding this. Before, we suffered in sin, for sin, and from sin. We were sinful, and, and we were suffering at the hands of sin. We were sinful. And because of that, we, are under, we were under the weight of the consequences of sin, the eternal consequences of sin, that we stood condemned before God. And we, had, and we were afraid of death because we had no hope as long as we were in sin. But as we are introduced to Christ and we received what he offered, we, now, we have been relieved of that. And now we suffer from sin. We still suffer from sin, but for a different reason. Instead of suffering in sin, for sin, and from sin, now we suffer because of sin, because we want to see sin eradicated. We want it eradicated from our lives, and we want it eradicated from the lives of those around us, because we see, we see the effect of sin, we suffer the effect of sin, and we grieve for those who are still under the weight of sin and death. We, that, that, that's a completely different perspective, so it's a different type of suffering. Before, our suffering had no hope at the end. There was, there was, it had no hope. God would use our suffering to bring us to himself, to relieve us of that suffering. But now the suffering we have is the same suffering as Jesus. We, we are now finished with sin. We don't want anything to do with it. We suffer as Jesus suffered because we too are done and finished with sin. We're finished with it. Done. Just done. So, what does that mean? Well, in Romans 8, it says this. It speaks to this. I'm not going to go there. You can look at it. It's in the notes. As Jesus groans, suffers for the world because of sin. It's, Romans 8 says, all of creation groans, waiting for its redemption, the redemptions of the sons of God. Now we groan because we are waiting for Jesus to come back for us. And in the waiting, we're watching what sin's effect is on the world. And we are we no longer feel the weight of sin because we are no longer we, we are not under its condemnation. But now we feel the weight of sin because we see and we understand and we grieve with Jesus the crushing effects of those who are still under its weight. This should compel us to live the life Peter is calling us to live. That we would walk with Jesus, allow him to be manifest in us, his glory would be revealed in us. They, our character, his character, and his goodness would be seen in us and through us. We have experienced it, we have realized it in reality, and now we bring it into the world. This should cause us to want to live this way. Not looking down on the rest of the world, but walking among them. And in fact, if, if we're to do it like Jesus, we actually look up at the world. Jesus... Wash the disciples' feet, and what was his posture to do so? He would have had to kneel. So it is, we come into this world and we get to offer grace and mercy. We get to be the expression of that. And when we live our life rightly, as good citizens and good neighbors, when we live a life that reflects the goodness of Christ, his manner and his way, we bring this into the lives of others. We are now salt on their tongue. We're now light on their path. Now, the question, next question would be, for what should a Christian suffer? What are some, what are some real things that we might, be, that if we conduct ourselves a certain way, or we take certain positions and postures, what will we suffer? And this is not an exhaustive list, but here are a couple things that I want us to be, to be thinking of. And there's a number of places this suffering can come from, but I just want to go to these points. First of all, we've already said it. We will suffer from sin. 
We ourselves will have sinned and therefore know we grieved our father. We, we then live out the consequences of that sin and then the discipline and the correction that comes when we sin to, to repent, to come back from the path of, of that sin back into proximity and walking in fellowship with God in an effective way. So in sin, sin having sinned in general, we're gonna suffer that. But also we see this, again, we see the sin, the effect of sin on our world. And that should grieve us. So that should cause us to suffer. That should cause us to want to move forward. Here's the second thing. We're going to suffer because of Jesus himself. That we have placed our faith in Jesus. And there's a, there, you know, part of the world around us sees that as foolishness. Or they see it as, who do you think you are? Or why would Jesus, why do you think Jesus is exclusive? Well, the exclusivity of Jesus isn't that he's exclusive only to Christians. And that's something we got to get right. The fact of the matter is, is Jesus died for all people <laughs> in, in all places in full view of the diversity of men and women, racial, ethnicity, times and places. For God so loved the world that he offered his son. He sent his son into the world that whoever would believe would have eternal life and not be condemned. He did this for all. So his exclusivity has nothing to do with who is acceptable, who, who, can, who can hear, who can receive, and who will be accepted. The exclusivity happens when, it, when we stand before our Father. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. So the exclusivity, exclusivity of Christ is not that, is not, has nothing to do with who, who can enter the kingdom has to do with who is in the kingdom and by what means. And that means is Christ Jesus. And so there will be a time, there will be times when the foolishness of our placing our, our faith in Christ is, is, could be seen as less than smart, less than intelligent, less than academic. We could be seen as naive or ignorant that we would believe at all, that it's unwise the next, so one, we're gonna suffer the effects of sin. Two, we're gonna suffer because of Jesus himself. Three, because we live according to God's way and wisdom. We just live according to his way and wisdom. We live according to God's way. And it's, his economy is utterly different than the economy of the world. And so we bring mercy, even if we have not received mercy. We love those who treat us poorly. We bless those who curse us. We pray for those who mistreat us. We give to those who have taken and we do not demand it back. We live civil, peaceable lives according to the law of the land and we do not meddle in other people's business. That is utterly contrary to the world. And so when we live the way of God, when we live the way of Christ, frankly it stands in contrast with the world and it doesn't always, doesn't always connect very well. And next is this, purity of life. Peter earlier says, he says, they're, they're, they're not going to understand why you're not in, you know, diving into their stuff with them. They, they're not going to get it. They're going to wonder, why? Why don't you join us in this? They can't understand why we wouldn't and why we don't, and they think it's strange that we wouldn't join them. That in and of itself can cause tension. That in and of itself can cause conflict. That in and of itself can cause misunderstanding. But on top of that, when we live a life that reflects the purity and the holiness of the kingdom, it stands in direct contrast or in direct opposition to the world. And so depending on, on how somebody sees that and receives it, it could actually cause conflict or even persecution because our lives lived rightly in the manner and way of Christ. Again, if all of a sudden we're being meddlers, or where our, our lives are, you know, our life and the practice of our life is utterly hypocritical from who it is we say we are and the name that we carry, then we deserve whatever it is we get. We deserve it. But the fact is, when we live according to the way of Christ and we're merciful and we're gracious and we're kind and we're loving and we're generous and we're hospitable and we give to those who, who are not going to pay us back and we don't demand back that, you know, the thing that somebody has taken or we bless those who curse us or we pray for those who mistreat us, that is so contrary, that is so different that there are some in our world that is gonna, that's going to convict their heart or it's going to cause them anger or it's going to cause contention. And we may suffer that way because we are functioning purely. It sheds light on the lives of those who refuse to or who don't or even revel 
in their impurity. And it's not a matter of picking a fight. It's not pointing. It's not looking down. It's not judging. It's not being con- condemning. It is living, just living graciously, lovingly, faithfully, and honestly. And it, sometimes that's going to bring persecution. It's going to bring conflict. Here's another area where we might suffer, even though we're living in the manner and way of Christ. And that's when we take a righteous stand, when we have to stand for something. When we refuse to be pushed, not only are we living differently, but we see something in our culture that we cannot, we can, we cannot stand for. And it's the sacred nature of the kingdom and the sacredness of life. The sacredness of life and the living. And listen, the personhood of all persons and the dignity of each and every person. The fact of the matter is, we can talk about racism. We can talk about bigotry. We can talk about the idea of, of the life, of, of life existing, and not only life existing from conception, but, and not only that's a human form of life, but that life is a person, and not only from conception, but right to death, and that that life deserves dignity from beginning to end, regardless of age, regardless of development, regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of eco- socioeconomic standing. We must stand for the dignity of life, the sacredness of life, we have to stand there. We have to stand there. And when we stand there, there will be opposition. There will be persecution. But don't let it be because of the way we stand. Let it be that we stand. That we stand in Christ Jesus and we stand, yes, according to the truth, but also that it's mingled with grace and love and mercy and care and compassion and kindness There are times we make righteous stands and they are the right stand to take and it is is to lay our back over a person who for whatever reason has had their personhood stolen. Let me say that again. It is to lay our back over the back of a person who has had their personhood stolen. And that can happen for any reason. Again, from conception to death, ethnicity and race, social state, whatever it might be, we get to join Jesus in, in dignifying each person and walking beside them in a way to bring mercy and grace and the love of God into their life. We get to do that. <sighs> now, the next question would be this. How do we do this? What does this look like? With what tone? When we make a stand, let, it's going to stand in contrast with the world if not direct opposition to the world and to what the world stands for. And they are not going to see why we're doing it, let alone understand why we're doing it. So here's what's really important. Any stand we take, if persecution comes, let it not be because of the stand, let it be because of the stand we take, not for the manner or the ill-mannered way which with, we, which, with which we make the stand. You know, when Peter says, to, in answering the, the reason for our hope, he says, do it with gentleness and respect. Dignify the one who asks. Don't be quarrelsome, but be peaceable. It is possible to have these discussions, to make these stands in such a way as to bring, as to bring life into the circumstance. There's another reason why we may suffer. And that's integrity, unwavering, in the face of opposition and coercion. To understand, but because of the decisions made according to God's word and his wisdom, and that the world will not understand it, and they're not going to seek wisdom, and they're, not, they're simply not going to be wise according to God's way and his manner and his wisdom, this is going to lead to some things. When we decide to do things certain ways, when we make decisions that are seemingly contrary to the world's wisdom or the world's way, it's going to at least lead to questioning People may look at it and wonder why. The second is it could lead to mocking. Why would you not, the question why and asking for discourse and explanation, that will happen. But then there's why that is actually an act of mocking. Why would you do, why, why would you ever, why would you? That's going to come. There, it could also come in this, that they will attempt to persuade you to act otherwise, to join them or to, to understand that the way, the way you're thinking that, mm, nah. And then, even more pointed, 
we'll be we can be accused of exclusivity based on objective truth, that we believe this to be true. I cannot act in any way other than the, what, the, what the truth is, and therefore, I must do this. And so now it's not just an attempt to persuade to act otherwise. Now it's literally an argument about what is truth and why you, would why you believe that is the truth and, how, and, and what that makes us look like when we stand according to the truth. Hmm. So what's next? How should we act in the suffering? How should we conduct ourselves? What should our attitude be? How should a Christian respond in suffering? What should we do? What should we be? What should our response look like? First and foremost, we need to be seen, that we need to, in our hearts, and be seen in trusting God and his word. We need to trust his word. We need to, tr what he has said about himself. Because what we know about God, Frank, the, the Holy Spirit certainly instructs us, corrects us, gives us truth, there's no doubt about it. First John calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. But the fact is, God has revealed himself through his word, and what that word says is an expression of who he is. He is telling us who he is by what he has said. So we have to trust his word. So I'm going to go to Psalm 119 for a moment, starting at verse 41. It says, may your unfailing love come to me. May I, may I experience, realize and experience your unfailing love. May it come to me, Lord, your salvation according to your promise or according to your word or what your word promises or what you promise in your word. Verse 42, then I can answer anyone who taunts me. I can answer anybody who would come against me. I would answer anybody who would mock me because I trust in your word. Verse 43, never take your word of truth from my mouth. Never take it from me. In other words, don't let me ever stammer there. But in fact, I have put my hope in your law. Therefore, bring it up and out of me. I will always obey your law forever and ever. I see that it's good. I know that it works. You have proven yourself and shown yourself to me in it. And I will walk up and listen to this, verse 45. I will walk about in freedom. Freedom. For I have sought your precepts. I know the way to go. Your word lights the path in front of me. I, because I know the truth, I do not have to be afraid of lies. Even when somebody stands opposed to me, they want to mock me. They, no, I stand in freedom because I know your truth. I rely on your truth. And even if they don't agree with your truth, I, I don't have to be moved from your truth. So I will walk in freedom. For I sought out your precepts. I will speak of your statutes before kings and will not be put to shame. For I delight in your commands because I love them. I see their value. I have experienced them. I reach out for your commands, which I love, that I may meditate on your decrees, that I may live out your word, that they may fill my mind and fill my heart and then dictate my actions. So the first thing we have to do, how do we respond? We put our trust in God and his sovereignty according to his word, and we rely on that. The second thing is, listen, these are nothing new, all right? But it's important we recognize this. And this is in the midst of everyday life, everyday life. That's why Peter says, he says, listen, don't be a criminal. Don't live civilly. Live according to the law. Live, live rightly. Do right. Then he says, now, be a good neighbor. Be a good friend. Don't be a meddler. How do we live when all of a sudden, you know, how should we live? Well, how should we act when all of a sudden somebody might oppose us? Well, trust in God's word. Recognize that he, he is guiding us according to that word. And second, be prayerful. Be prayerful. Pray in an unceasing fashion. Remain in constant contact with God. Speak back and forth with him. What's next? Be kind. To who? To all. Be kind. to God was kind to us when I was his enemy. He died for me. He revealed himself to me by being patient with me and tolerant of me and, uh, you know, as, as I'm working through the process and the progress of not only coming to him but now walking with him. And his kindness toward me is, is what guides me to repentance. It's intended to do so. My kindness reflects that same kindness and it may draw the heart of the one who's opposed to me into the repentance of God. Next is be peaceable. We've already spoken on this. I'm not going to go too deep into it. Not quarrelsome, but be careful and considerate in responding to others. So, again, we're trusting in God's word. He will give us the, the, the truth. He'll give us the way. He'll give us the manner. He'll give us the wisdom. Be prayerful that we might be able to hear it and receive it and then speak of it. In the midst of that, be kind toward men. And then in, in, in being kind, don't be quarrelsome, but be peaceable. And now be careful and considerate in responding to others. Listen carefully. Speak as you're enabled, or you know, ask to learn more. And then may our lives reflect joy, 
Though the times and circumstances are perilous, let's keep our eyes on God and trusting ourselves to him and his promises and, and, and what he has promised to do in the midst of our peril and what he does with our suffering. So we want to be trust, trusting his word, prayerful, kind to all, peaceable, we would be kind, careful, considerate in how we respond, joyful in, the, in, in our modus operandi in the manner in which we live. But here's another part of it, reflective. If we want to avoid that us versus them thing, if we want to bring the kingdom of heaven in by mercy and grace and love and faithfulness, that we would reflect to the world what Jesus has done for us, we need to reflect. Not just reflect Jesus, but reflect upon him, remembering, recalling, recollecting, and repeating to ourselves, God's faithfulness, where we were when he found us, what he did when he found us, what our lives have been like since he found us, and that the people we're talking to are in the exact same boat we were in, that we would be merciful. Now, here's a good one. You ready for this? We have to be resolute. We have to be committed to what? To living what Peter's called us to, to, to live to and what, the, what Jesus has empowered and enabled us to live to. He has made us righteous. He's, we are now the expression of his goodness in us by his spirit. When we live, when we walk in step with the spirit according to God's word in, in, you know, in the character of Christ Jesus, we become salt and light. We, become, we, we, we walk like Jesus, and we need to be committed to that. We need to be committed to walking according to the way he has called us. And Peter puts it this simply, be a good citizen, be a good neighbor. Be kind, loving, and considerate. Be resolute in this. Walk according to the way of Jesus. Doing what's right and what's just and what's fair and doing it graciously. If we are persecuted, if we are mocked or hated, we're to bless. This is a real act. This is receiving, not receiving what it is they're doing. Listen, it's not, a, if, if, if we're walking in Christ Jesus and somebody is opposed to that and they begin to, and they decide to mock us, hate us, persecute us, curse us, it's not about us. <laughs> it's not. It's about Jesus and it's about them. Don't receive it from them. That doesn't mean, you don't swallow it and allow your heart to be wounded. No. That's not what God wants. What God wants us to do is be able to offer back to them what it is Christ has offered you. I don't know about you, but my life was a curse to Jesus before I knew him. You know what he did? He saved me. He met me mercifully. He, he offered me grace. He's been faithful to me. I am to bring that same spirit into every conversation I'm a part of, every relationship. And if somebody chooses to, to take it out on me, my, what Jesus calls us to do is to bless them. Bless them. Pray for them. Give to them. How do we do that? We entrust ourselves to God and his care. We, are tr we entrust ourselves. We remember who it is we are in Christ, what it is that God has declared, that the Holy Spirit is in us, that God is for us, nobody can be against us, and we lean into God recognizing that even if I lose my life in this moment, Go back and read the story of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Read it. Even if I should die in this moment, I am with God in glory. I am his child. I have hope. And trust yourself to God and his care and know that he will make right this thing, whatever he determines is right according to his will. And here's the last thing. Walk in freedom. This is all true. You are a child of God. Be free. You are free to be good. You are free to be righteous. You are free to be generous. You are free to be hospitable. You are free to not ask anything back because God knows what you need. He'll make sure you get it. Don't worry about what you have or don't have. Don't worry about where it went or who got it or how they got it. God, you are God's. Be free. Be free. Now, here's the last thing. As we reflect on this portion of 1 Peter 3, be prepared to give a reason for your hope. Even if you, he said, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. You set Christ apart as Lord and be prepared to give a reason for your hope when you're asked. And when you do so, do so with gentleness and respect. And now into what we just read in 1 Peter 4, in these reflections, 
if we live the way God, the way God has asked us to live, empowered us to live, enabled us to live, understand this. You will be asked why you believe what you believe. You'll be asked, are we ready? Are we daily setting apart Christ as Lord? Are we daily giving him, literally giving him our lives and our heart? Are we every day getting up and saying, Father, the affections of my heart can be drawn everywhere. Cause me to come after you. Let me see you as my Lord, my King, my God, my priest, my friend, my brother, my Savior. Remind me of where I was. Remind me of what you've done. Remind me of who I am in you. Remind me. Open my eyes to suffer how you suffer as I watch the people around me being crushed under the weight of their sin. And may my heart be ready to share joyfully, cheerfully the hope that I have. People are not gonna understand my life. They're not gonna understand my hope. They're not gonna understand why I live the way I do. They're not gonna understand why I say what I say. They, they're not gonna get it. Father, don't let me be offended by that. Don't let me be ashamed of you. Don't let me be pushed back or drawn into behaving in a way that is unbecoming out of fear or desire to be wanted. But in fact, remind me. In that, recognize this. As you live this way, at school, at work, in your neighborhood, at the store, in the drive-thru, wherever it might be, there are gonna be those who see it and admire it and appreciate it, and they'll say something to you. They will. And that's wonderful, that's affirmation, and that, that feels good. Then there will be some who will question and wonder, and they'll eventually ask you. Those are the ones who are kind of titillated by it, and they've been watching you, and they can't figure out, why does he react the way he does? Why does she do what she does? Why does she? And then they private, they'll come to you privately, and they'll say, tell me about what? Mm. That is fantastic. Understand this. Those moments are moments to share the hope that you have with those who see it, are moved by it, appreciate it, and are, and, are, and are moved to ask you about it. So be prepared for that. What can we do in that instance? What can we do? What, what should we be? Well, we can be praying for that person, that the influence of the, as we are influenced by the Holy Spirit and, and, and he is moving in us in a way that reveals himself, we should be prayerful for the person, the opportunity, and the conversation that God would give us the wisdom and the words to just respond, and the manner and the way, gentle and respectful. Second, be sharp and consistent. This is the idea of being resolute, be committed. Walk steadily with Jesus, spending time in the word. Let it work in and on you in such a way that you are able to be consistent in moral and ethical uh, behavior and your character itself. May you reflect, may we reflect, may I reflect everything in every way, Jesus. Continue to be humble and quiet and peaceable. Live peaceable lives. Be careful not to engage in things that would be in conflict with that, that would somehow, somehow um, cast a shadow on your person. And then be prepared for those conversations. Be prepared. So we want to do that. We want to make sure that we're ready for that moment. So we want to continue to live peaceably among those with whom we work and play. We want to genuinely display the, the joy of the hope that we have, being continually mindful of God in our lives. In every circumstance and encounter, be respectful, be reasonable, be gracious and kind, work hard, do your job well, and do not be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to go to somebody and invite them into your life as this is part of humili the humility that opens the doors to share that space, to share your space, being prepared to give reasons for your hope and joy. You know, when I was a youth pastor, and I, and I know we've run over a little bit, so bear with me, but we've only got a little bit more to go. When I was a youth pastor, one of the things I used to do, to, especially if I had a junior hire who was a little bit of a stinker, or a senior hire who had unfortunately lived a life that maybe got them in trouble and their reputation was besmirched and, and they had lost trust. Because at junior high, you really haven't done that. By the, by the time you're 17, 18 years old, all of a sudden people are starting to hold you at arm's length. And so what I would do is I would spend time with them and I would find the kids that everybody else wanted to give up on. And those are the kids that I would go ask for help. If I was working on something, especially computers as they were coming out, I didn't know anything. I would grab the most troubled kid in the room and say, show me how to do this. I'm not a gamer. 
Kids playing video games. The kid's a problem. I go over to him. I say, hey, teach me how to play this game. Hey, I need something. Can you go get it for me? Here are my keys. Would you go do that? The fact of the matter is, is the people around me who desperately need the kingdom of heaven, I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to be alert to who they are. I want to be wise in regard to how I function around them. I want to, I want to treat them with mercy and grace, and I want to open the doors for opportunity. And I do that just by being gracious and kind and giving them chance. And that's true in every area of our life. Now, that is true of people who see us and admire and appreciate. They may wonder and come and ask, and we need to be prepared for that. Then there are two others that I want to make sure we reflect on very quickly in terms of how we respond. There are going to be some who will mock you and, and, and act toward, and with derision toward you. They're going to mock you. And the other is there are going to be those who actually hate and persecute you. In this world, Jesus said, listen, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they treated me this way, they're going to treat you this way. How do we act toward them? What do we do? Well, we need to recognize, as the first two people we talked about, those who admire and appreciate, those who would come and ask, they're close to the kingdom. They see it, they appreciate it, their hearts are moved by it. They may very well be ready to receive Christ. These people, eh, generally, they're far from the kingdom. But does that mean we give up on them? (laughs) Absolutely not. But it does mean that we have certain things we need to do in their lives and with them. First of all, recognize that those things are going to come Don't argue with them. Don't fight with them. Don't. If you need to walk away from them, walk away. But that doesn't mean that we still don't have effect on them. And the effect we have on them is by our lives. The only thing that's going to impress this person over time is our consistency, our integrity, and our honesty. Now, Proverbs, 7, Proverbs 9, 7, and 8 says this, Whoever corrects a mocker invites insults. Whoever rebukes the wicked incurs abuse. Do not rebuke mockers. They will hate you. So the idea of arguing with them, fighting with them, putting it in their grill, trying to persuade them in some way, that no, stop it. Stop. But neither do you need to receive their abuse. No. How do we live among them? We live consistently in front of them. Period. We certainly pray. We pray for them consistently. But we are not to be drawn into their way or into their world. Second, be patient and kind. Let their words and actions literally roll off your shoulder. It's not about you. It is not about you. Don't let it be about you. Don't receive it. Here's the next thing. Watch and see if at any point one of them begins to soften and pray specifically for them. Be prepared for them in particular. If it's a group of people who are mocking you or persecuting you or or throwing derision at you, listen. Watch them. Pray for them. Keep a distance, don't argue with them, don't join them, but begin to pray and see if even one of them begins to crack. One of them begins to wonder. One of the, and then pray for them specifically and be prepared for that conversation. They may come to you the way Nicodemus came to Jesus. Afraid of what they'd be, look like with their friends, they're gonna come to you secretly and get, they're gonna ask you, watch. It's exactly what happened to Nicodemus and that later we see that Nicodemus would come to faith. Be ready. They may come to you. If we choose to fight or argue or retaliate against their derision, if we are antagonistic or accusatory or judgmental toward them, we will, listen, we will have negated our impact, we have potentially forfeited our opportunity, and we have belied our supposed approachability. We have made ourselves an enemy. We already were that, but we don't have to act like that. And we may even hurt our credibility. Our character could be called to suspect. Because now we're acting like everybody else would act. Don't go there. But instead, act humbly, graciously, kindly. And if we mess up, go ahead, Ben, get in place. If we mess up, may we be the first to go ask forgiveness. May we be the first to go apologize. May we be the first to admit our own frailty, our own sin, and be honest and transparent, even with this person, as to show them that we are not above them. We are just different than they are. 
What, is this, what does all this mean? It means we have to have spent time with Jesus. We have to. Acts 4.13 says this. Peter and John being persecuted by the Sanhedrin, being questioned by those people who, who, who were opposed to them, who were angry with them, who mocked them for who they were and what they were saying. When they finally questioned them and they just stood firm in Christ Jesus, resolute to the truth, and were kind and gracious and respectful in their response, this is how that group of people responded. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished, astonished, and they took note that they had been with Jesus. What prepares us to live in this world the way God is calling us to live in this world, and Peter writes and admonishes and instructs us to live in this world? That we would spend time with Jesus, we would be with him, and that when people see us, what, what is radiating from us, what is coming from us, what is consistently a part of our lives is the evidence that we have spent time with Jesus in his word, in prayer, in fellowship, in worship, and in practice. May we live lives that call people to grace through being kind and merciful, respectful, and, and gentle May God flow in us and through us in a way that, is, that just, just speaks of his glory and his honor. Um, have a wonderful week, guys. You guys set? Okay. We were dead, made alive in Christ. We are forgiven of our debt Legal demands, these are set aside God nailed them all to the cross We who were dead, we were dead Made alive in Christ We are forgiven of our debt Set aside God nailed them all to the cross You changed You changed our lives You saved our souls
Amen. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us today for our online service. It was good to be with you. And uh, remember, a couple quick things. Men's and women's groups, if you'd like to still jump in on one, you can get in on those. It started last week, but this is just week two. You'll have another five weeks or so with those people, so check those out online. The drive through adventure is this Saturday. Grab your family, grab some friends, join us for that big old fun scavenger hunt, win some prizes. That's going to be a good time. And then remember, moving forward, we'll update you on Thursdays if we, if we stay in red, if we're yellow, orange. We'll be back in the service area uh, in the building next week for two services. We'll keep you posted on all of that stuff. Have an awesome week. Enjoy your Sunday. Go Browns. Beat the Steelers. And uh, hey, everybody, have a great week. It was good to see you.